Thank you for doing that. That too is very neighborly. Uh, so thank you for being hospitable to one another. Let me explain for our guests um, where you find us this morning. Every summer, we do a sermon series entitled, What's Up With That?, uh, which is a series entirely comprised of actual questions that someone in our church family wanted to have answered. And we're, oh, somewhere on the front end of that today. Um, here's the question that we're going to talk about today. Someone asked me to talk for one Sunday about the relationship between personal sacrifice and happiness. But they didn't just want me to talk about this generally, because here's what they added on to it. This is about marriage for them. Now, for those of you who aren't married, I do think what we're going to say today applies to every relationship, i.e. your parents with your friends that you might have. This person specifically wanted us to talk about marriage. But by doing so, we're really going to get underneath a lot of what we as human beings and what we as Christians think about the two key words in the question itself. What do we think about sacrifice? What do we think about happiness? This person's concern was that in their marriage, and no, I can imagine all the stares that are going to go on at one another in the car ride home. You have no idea who asked this question, and you won't. And I begged him not to tell me. Right. Well, Heather, Heather asked it, really. She's the one who asked the question. <laughs> Which is why I'm preaching today. <laughs> um, gosh, I totally lost my train of thought. Uh, so, he wants to know why it is that in his marriage, or she in her marriage, feels like She's the one who is giving a lot or sacrificing a lot, and in the end, he or she feels very unhappy because of it. Now, here's the image that I want to paint for you. I want us to handle this in the way that we would want you to handle it. So you need to imagine as if this person is your friend, and they ask this question of you. And they said, hey, can we go to Starbucks and let's sit down. I want to talk to you about something. And this is what they laid out for you. How would you respond? What wisdom from your faith, from your Christianity, would you give to them about this very personal subject, the relationship between sacrifice and happiness in a marriage? What would you say? Of course you're going to be empathetic. You're going to care that they're hurting but move beyond that. What help or advice can you offer them? And I have decided that I am going to uh, damn the torpedoes today, and I'm going to do this with my wife. This is my wife, Heather, uh, because, of course, this is the woman that I've had the great privilege of being married and to. Sacrificed and, sacrificed and sacrificed. I have sacrificed so much for, for That's right. In our 107 years together hey, in marriage. <laughs> I just realized it's almost 18. It is almost 18. Are you clapping because I just remembered? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have obviously, probably like many of you, had to, even if we've never asked the question in this way, uh, we've had to wrestle with the issue of sacrifice and personal happiness. And so I wanted to do this with her because we've had to try to work this out ourselves. And, uh, of course, it's going to be way more entertaining if I do it. I'm not her. sure. Like, I don't know how he does this because there are notes, and now I don't know what in the world I wrote. And he, like, wrote this outline and... Welcome to my life. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> she also, just uh, a, a bit of background on my missus, we actually met in graduate school. So Heather is very fond of... She was a master's student. I was a Ph.D. student. When we got married... Her grades went up, my grades went down. <laughs> uh, she's fond of calling herself a master's uh, degree dropout, but she's actually only one or two classes away from her own master's in biblical counseling. So she brings a lot of expertise to the table as well. If I could remember any, I mean, that was like, well, guess what, 18 years ago. <laughs> so if I could remember any of it, I'm a genius, but... I had kids, so I don't remember a lot of <laughs> what I studied. 
So what we want to do today is we want to focus on the two key topics that this person raised. We want to talk about sacrifice and we want to talk about happiness and what counsel we could offer this person and, of course, to all of us. To do that, we're going to talk about unhealthy ways to think about sacrifice. Then we're going to flip it and talk about healthy or biblical ways to think of it. And then we'll do the same with, uh, with happiness, okay? So let's start with sacrifice. Here are some unhealthy things uh, that we need you to be aware of when we talk about the subject of sacrifice. And Heather's going to start with number one. So I wonder if when we talk about sacrifice, if we feel like a lot of times it's just giving in. And in a marriage, and, and even in ours, I think there are times that it's not worth fighting anymore. And so I think we've all felt at times like we've rolled over and we've been a peacemaker. And it certainly feels like sacrifice because it hurts. And that's maybe not what sacrifice is supposed to feel like. Losing isn't sacrifice. Um, that's just peace at any price. So I, we might be doing what's easy when sacrifice, we're going to talk about a little bit later, is supposed to feel different than I have lost and I'm tired of losing all the time. And long term, that's not sacrifice. No wonder you don't feel happier if really all you've done is just given up and said, I don't want to have this fight anymore. So that's the, the first one that we discussed. And the payoff on this is the bottom line. We want to get something, and they want to get something. And um, my question to you is, what are you getting from this current dynamic where you feel like that you're giving all the time, where you're losing all the time? And um, I'm, I'm not sure that you can feel happy when you are – in a relationship that's supposed to be communal and instead you feel like you've just lost or rolled over and that that's um, not a way to ever feel happy and think about losing as sacrifice. That means that you're not in a relationship where there's agreement and unity and wow, that doesn't sound like happiness either. You know what it feels like to come to an agreement no matter how hard it is and no matter how many awkward conversations that you have, like maybe in some big decisions, buying a house or changing jobs, you know what it feels like when you've come to an agreement and it doesn't feel like sacrifice when you do that. Right, right. Are you looking at me because we do agree a lot? Or no, that, remember that one time yeah. that we agreed? <laughs> <laughs> you seemed like the guy to look at for that. So similar to that, is what you might say uh, sac unhealthy sacrifice is a lack of boundaries. You realize there are things in your life that you should never sacrifice for anybody, even your spouse. It is inappropriate for them to ask it of you, and therefore it is also inappropriate for you to give it away. Can you think of what those things might be in your life? Uh, you should never be willing to sacrifice your emotional, psychological well-being for the sake of somebody else. You should not be willing to sacrifice your relationship with God and the components of it that make it work for somebody else. You should not be willing to sacrifice healthy relational dynamics for somebody else. Now, you can't be impatient. It may take time for you to put healthy behaviors in place in your marriage. It may take time for you to get your partner to see that they need to give you space in your life to go to church, to have time where you rest, etc. But here's the thing. You've been sold a bill of goods if you think that in your marriage it means you have to give in or give away everything that's you or everything that's crucial to your life. No, there are some things you should not give away. I'll give you a, a concrete example from our marriage. I am married to, God love me, the most extroverted person I have ever met in my life. Which means... Make it like a surprised face right now. Because <laughs> right. I can see right. everyone now. This is great. <laughs> and the ones that sleep, now I know. Right. 
Which means that Heather is wired to function really well and be really healthy when she has ample opportunity to be with people, having fun with people, going out with people for having dinner. Having fun at all? Having fun at all, which you do not at home. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. I'm next. You're going to okay. note we have a very dry wit, so you can join in on that. My point is for her, she shouldn't give that away because this is who she is. And it would be impossible for her to be happy if I demanded of her that she were at home every night, that she couldn't go out, that she couldn't prioritize her church small group. These would be requests that I shouldn't make because they were to her detriment. And moreover, they should be boundaries that she doesn't let me cross. She can do it kindly, but she needs to be able to tell me, nope, that is not something I am willing to give away. That is unhealthy sacrifice. Okay, number three. So it seems like maybe we have a definitional problem. And in marriage, do you ever feel like you're having two completely different conversations? One of the things that I think that, that we're still working on is what do we mean when we say sacrifice? What do we mean by a, like a good marriage? What do we mean by we're getting something from a marriage? Our definitions are so different because our personalities are so different. Um, one of the things that I wonder, since we're talking about specifically marriage, is does sacrifice in this question mean showing love to each other? Uh, for Chris, showing love has a lot more to do with um, feeling like that things are under control at home, um, that it's being run well, that surprises aren't hitting him all the time. For me, showing love has to do with spontaneity and um, coziness and doing things together as a family. And even though we would say that we both think doing to get things together as a family is a top priority for us and that um, sacrifice both ways to make sure that we're spending time together, um, sounds like we're saying the same thing. Spending time together at home for him means being under the same roof Spending time together to me is all four of us in the same bed. <laughs> so, like, we have to be touching for me <laughs> to define spending time together. And is it, isn't it? There's no room for daddy left. Can, can, if we're all in the same bed together, can we all play Call of Duty together? That does not. Thank you. Thank Listen, you. Peanut Gal. That's my whole small group. Um, see, clearly... Call of Duty has nothing. Well, that would be sacrifice for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the boundaries one because right. it's just, it's never, it's you never. You don't need my help distracting you. Happen. Focus, focus. Fo what? <laughs> what page are we on? So, uh, one thing that I, that I had to think of was love languages um, and my willingness to maybe rearrange my definition a little bit and him to, I'm sure you've rearranged yours. My husband is a gift giver. And no matter how much money that we have, he will always be thinking of creative ways to give little things to me and the kids. And that is why God made five below. <laughs> because he can take my kids and get candy, every Coke, because I like the real Coke. I don't really like Diet Coke, but we all drink it because we have to, even though it's probably killing us. But every Coke that is brought home to me from the store means I was standing at the checkout thing and I thought of you and even though he was doing all of the grocery shopping a coke means that because he's a gift giver as a love language that he was thinking of me and wow I missed that for like 15 years giving me a coke and not going out to dinner and spending quality time to me was a complete definitional issue Right. that I adjusted it, and then I started feeling a little bit more loved. So anyway, sacrifice probably has to do with how you're feeling about love. Good conversation to have. If right. you feel like that you're giving all the sacrifice, ask the other one what the heck they mean by sacrifice. Right. In the end, the end, or the the end result or the bottom line of this is you need to ask yourself, if you're the one who thinks you're serving a lot or you're sacrificing a lot, you just need to ask yourself, how's that working for you? Because the hallmark of biblical morality or wisdom, 
as portrayed in the Proverbs of the Old Testament is that it makes your life better. Here are some things from the, Pro- from the Proverbs in the Old Testament we're told about what happens when you live wisely. Your home is blessed. Um, your work, you heard in the psalm that Heather read to start the service today, the work of your hands becomes prosperous. There is a wellspring of life that bubbles up in your soul, the Proverbs say. And on and on and on the list goes. Wisdom is, in the end, its own benefit, its own consequence, its own paycheck. So conversely, if you think you're sacrificing and bending over backward and all you get is frustration and anger and resentment because of what you're doing, then something's unhealthy or out of whack. You need to ask yourself if what you're doing, even if you think it's for the right reasons, is working for you. Because in the end, doing things the right way, maybe not immediately, but doing things the right way, God's way, will yield positive results in your relationship. It may be hard to start, but it will work in the end. Now let's flip it for you. Let's talk about, if those are some ways to think about sacrifice in an unhealthy way, here are some ways to think about it in a healthy and more biblically accurate way. You get to start this one. We're going to start a little bit, I think, talking about balance. And um, we kind of went different places in Scripture. And one of the places that I looked at was Philippians 2. And I think that this verse is really balanced. Look not only to your own interests, nothing wrong with that, but also to the interests of others. And I think that that's just a great, like, you can really beat each other up about how you're supposed to be sacrificing everything for the other person. It's not coerced out of you. This is something that you have the power to take over and own. Real sacrifice, you're in charge of. I had a friend who once told her husband, why don't you tell me that I'm pretty? Do you see that that's a (laughs) lose-lose? Because guess what? If he said, I think you're really pretty, he's already lost. And if he doesn't, which he didn't, because he wasn't going to be manipulated, she has lived the rest of her marriage saying, my husband doesn't think I'm pretty. Do you see that that's, I mean, that's a lose-lose. I don't care what the guy did. So you cannot be forced to sacrifice to someone else. And real sacrifice feels completely different. Have you ever done something that felt really, really good? That was a huge sacrifice for you? Have you ever been able to give a car away because of the incredible abundance that you've gotten? Have you ever spent time with a kid who has nothing to give? like in Kids Hope. I was mad for a whole year about my Kids Hope kid. And then this last year, I got to see some of the anger that she had. I almost, I, anybody? I almost quit, didn't I? Because all, I felt like that all I would ever see in this kid was anger and like just a tiny bit of seeing some of that anger dissipate felt so good. And it was also because it was completely in my control And so it yield, what are we talking about? Happiness. So, so is there something that you can think of that you never thought you could do that was a complete and total sacrifice that wasn't taken from you? You feel it. And that's why he lets me talk about all this stuff that says feel a lot of times, many times in this sermon, I will say feel. (laughs) Right? Right. Totally. Uh, You know, it's a funny thing that uh, biblically speaking, sacrificing for one another also tends to focus on the most important things um, for the other person. Uh, Here's a a biblical passage you can look up and reference that is said about husbands, but it could be equally said about wives. It's Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. And what Paul tells husbands there is, you need to love your wife like Christ loved the church, giving yourself for her so that she may become holy. And you think, okay, those are lovely ideas, but don't miss the point or the place that those words are focused. So if I, as Heather's husband, were to take those words as what I should be doing toward her, the thing that I should be doing for her is loving her like Jesus loves us. Okay, high bar. 
I should be giving myself or sacrificing myself for her for the purpose of making her holy, making her godly, helping her grow, helping her develop spiritually, personally, relationally. These are the places that I should sacrifice the most because they are the things that matter the most. Who does the laundry and how often is actually not that important. Sure, it needs to be done, and your son shouldn't stuff all his clean and or dirty clothes under his bed until you're trying to pack for camp at 11 o'clock last... Oh, did I say last night? <laughs> True story. And you, and you, right, true story. And I was you looking realize, to see if he was here because right. I can glare at him if I <laughs> see him. Right. You understand. You're married. There are things around the house that have to be done. But so often we think about sacrifice in terms of, well, this week I went and ran this errand for you. This week I did this for the kids and you didn't. And all these things are well and good. They are not the most important thing in your life or the life of your spouse. Me loving her and sacrificing for her and helping her grow into the heather that God imagined. Helping her become more and more, Paul's word, be holy. That's what really, really matters. And you know what? If I do that for her, she's not going to care nearly as much if we go a week without me cooking dinner or if I forget to put my shoes in the closet or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that actually leads to something, the last point on the screen, which is that you're going to know you're sacrificing in a biblical, healthy way when it brings out the best in your relationship, not the worst. When it brings out the best in the person you're sacrificing for, not the worst. This goes back to where Heather started. One of the earmarks of unhealthy sacrifice is it's a giving in. It's you rolling over which brings out the worst in the person you're rolling over to. You're helping them be a bully. You're helping them be small-minded or short-sighted about what really matters. You're helping them be dogmatic or domineering. This is not bringing out their best. That's why one of the best things you could do, maybe, depending on your marriage, is you need to have boundaries where you should have boundaries. And maybe the best thing you could do for your wife or your husband is that you guys need to have a little conflict done in a healthy, proactive way, but you need to stop because your sacrifice is not bringing out the best of you or her, you or him, or both of you together. You see that? All right, now let's flip. Let's talk about happiness. Let's talk about unhealthy happiness and then a more healthy biblical way of thinking about happiness. Um, let's start here with unhealthy happiness. And you need to realize that oftentimes we are our own worst enemies about this subject. And it's because we tend to define the subject in the way that our particular culture does. Which is to say, many of us have a very American definition of happiness. And that's dangerous. Think about how our culture and maybe the TV you consume or the movies you consume or the music you listen to or just the friends you interact with, the books you read, how do they define happiness? Well, there's, I'm going to post a video on our Facebook page this week that does some, uh, has a great discussion about the science of happiness. And let me suggest to you that most Americans think of happiness in what scientists call natural happiness terms. Here's what natural happiness is. Something good happens to you, and you get the burst of neurochemicals in your brain that make you feel better. So get the direction here. Something good happens to you, and then you feel good about it. Well, here's the problem with that model of happiness. Life makes it impossible for you to live up to that standard. You cannot be happy that way all the time. No one's life is that good. A lot of the people you know are trying to live that way. They are trying to buy enough things or with enough frequency that they feel good most of the time. They're trying to eat things that make them happy most of the time 
because they just want to feel good. They basically define happiness as if it were a positive emotion. And I'm just here to tell you, it is medically, not just spiritually, it is medically impossible for you to expect yourself to feel good all the time. Let's be candid about it. Every marriage you know, the best marriage you know, our marriage goes through seasons where you are not happy with each other by that definition. You do not for days or weeks or maybe even a few months because you're at, you're at a crossroads or you're at a hurdle, or you're in a conflict you haven't worked out yet, it is impossible for you to make each other feel good emotionally. You know, a lot of American people think that if you hit a, a moment like that in your marriage, it means something's wrong with it. No, it's just normal. Many of the divorces that you know have happened because people didn't realize that the first time they hit prolonged emotional unhappiness, that they shouldn't just leave each other and hope to find somebody who can do for them what really they can't, which is to make them emotionally happy all the time. You see that? That is a very unhealthy view of happiness, and it runs amok in our country. Now Heather's going to finish out this slide by talking about the rest of it. So what is the source of your happiness? We've talked about sacrifice and happiness. I'm not sure that sacrifice was ever the source of your happiness anyway. And I have to tell you, <clears throat> after going through a lot of stuff, I had to start pretending to be happy because I, th I felt as a codependent person that I was viewed as someone who was very weak and fragile and unhappy and I was being treated differently because of that. And so I had to start pretending to be okay. And it started working because I lowered the standards for the, hey babe, very low standards for you. Awesome. This is the secret <laughs> to our marriage. We just keep very, lowering the standards. Very, very low standards. <laughs> so my question is, is there anything else going on that's not, that has nothing to do with sacrifice? Are you dealing with someone who's domineering? Stop it, we have a time issue. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, you saying that to me. You talk a lot. <laughs> this is all of the talking he does in a whole week. Like, he won't even talk till Wednesday after, after he preaches. You think I'm kidding? No. Okay, so being communal is this something we... This was not a very good idea, was it? <laughs> I'm having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those people were paid. So... <laughs> Let's just keep our minds open to our relationships looking very different than we thought because being communal, being in a relationship, we don't want to downplay. But your happiness, we may really be talking about two different things and the source of your happiness, we may be looking in the wrong places for. So the other issue that, we, that we've got to give a little time to is power. One of the things that may make you feel unhealthy happiness is because you're looking to the wrong source for it. If you are waiting for someone else to be happy in your marriage or your boss or your children, they're probably not even happy at the same time as you. And, and honestly, I, if I had to wait for him to be happy, for me to be happy, I, I think we're always happy at completely different times. So, I mean, if, if just at least you could be missing the times that they're happy. And, and I think that we wouldn't do that maybe to our children or especially to our bosses. If you have to wait for your boss to be happy, for you to be happy, anybody? I mean, who knows how long we... There are weeks that, I mean, that you wouldn't be happy. So we can't... Um, we can't make the equation of their happiness being yours because that's a lot of pressure on them. And it's, and I, I just, I'm not sure that it's feasible. Um, we, we live under the same roof and I'm not, I, I when are you ever happy? <laughs> that's, that's not written down <laughs> here at all. So you've got it. It's worth you thinking about you being okay 
because it's a lot of pressure on other people, but it's also not fair to you. Right. Um, and we're going to say this, and in in, we're going to flip it around and say it in a positive way on the next slide. So if those are some things that uh, it would be wise for you to pay attention to about unhealthy ways in, of understanding happiness or this person who asked the question about their marriage, then let's say a few things that would be more healthy or would be more biblically accurate about healthiness or about uh, happiness. And the first thing to realize is that in your Bible, both Testaments, Old and New, so we're talking ancient Hebrew or ancient Greek as the language is, there's really two words that uh, equal our in modern English word uh, of happiness. You know what they are? One is joy and one is blessed or blessed. Now if you, and I'll, I'm going to actually uh, post a kind of a scripture exploration this week on Facebook. So if you want to take me up on what I'm about to say, you can do this yourself. If you read about joy and or blessedness in the Bible, you're going to find that it never, like ever, has anything to do with somebody else. Like a friend, or in this case, my wife. Nope. You know who it almost always has something to do with. And it doesn't surprise you. God. That God is always the source of joy. God is the one who blesses. Like in the psalm that Heather read, Psalm 128, verse 1, to start the service today. We are happy when we revere God and we keep his ways. That's how the Bible views it. Which means that we need to redefine what it is that we think happiness is. Let me call to mind for you a passage that all of us probably know, even the, the less biblically literate. One of the passages in your entire Bible that talks about happiness the most is something that we call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes is the opening section of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 given by Jesus. In your Bible, it says things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice in the world. Now, you know those words. Let's change out blessed for its synonym, happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the gentle. Happy are the merciful. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when you understand the word blessed for happy, all of a sudden your perspective gets changed. It is like you went to Jesus the chiropractor and he has put your spine back into alignment. No one in your world thinks of happiness this way, or very few. And this leads to point number two, which is, see, so often we make in our culture happiness the goal. And it's not. It's the byproduct of other goals. Happiness is not a destination. Happiness is a journey. How can you be happy? Well, according to Jesus in the Beatitudes, if you begin to live by those characteristics he places there, like making peace, being willing to be persecuted for the right things, being merciful, being humble, if you pursue those character traits, guess what you get as a byproduct? Happiness. But you have to be willing to pursue those things in order to to get it. Can you view happiness in your relationship with your spouse as something you will get if you go about it the right way? If you care about the right things? So, this is my wife. I mentioned the Beatitudes before. Let's take Jesus up on his words exactly as he said them and apply them to my marriage to my beautiful wife. I will be happy with Heather and I will feel happy with Heather according to Jesus if I'm the one who actively seeks to make peace when something's wrong. If I treat her as if I am poor in spirit or humble. If I treat her as if I will be merciful to her 
when on the very rare occasion she makes a mistake. Right? Right. If I, <laughs> <laughs> if I am gentle with her and not rash or angry. Same goes with parenting, by the way. You want to change your relationship with your kids? Tell them they can expect of you that you will treat them the way that Jesus said you ought to treat everybody. And watch them be happier with you and you happier with them as a result. You see that? You need to redefine what happiness is and how you get there. Because we've all been taught a lot that frankly is just wrong. And now Heather's going to finish this slide. So something we mentioned before is happiness it sounds so cliche, but this is about you, right? We don't have your spouse here to talk to. We're, we're talking to you as individuals, so they're off the hook. Let's just talk about you. You have the power to pursue sacrifice, and as an American, you have the power to pursue happiness. Good luck with that. But since, you know, in counseling, you always say, but I don't have the other guy here. So let's just talk about you. For right now, as much as we value marriage, we're just talking about you. And this is your choice. This is your responsibility. And really, there's a lot of power in that. So today, without them, you got a lot of thinking to do about you, right? Because I hope that feels empowering and not scary that you get to make this choice. You don't give this away. It's not their responsibility. This is about you. And if you don't feel happy, set this as a goal. Decide what happiness should look like, you know, and not some crazy, unrealistic goal that happiness can never be, that you're not going to get the side of heaven. And it seems like that that's maybe the first step and even feeling different, and even feeling more happy, because release yourself from all of the crazy expectations that you've, that you've had on yourself, that you've had on your spouse, that you've had on your kids, all of this sacrifice that you've dumped on yourself, and this life that is consumed with feeling happy all the time. I hope that feels empowering to you, not scary. We hope, so let's review really quickly. Um, there's a lot to think about today, or maybe there's just one or two things, but, but let's just kind of review what we've talked about, okay? Where should you be sacrificing in your marriage? Chris, we, the Bible sets the bar high because we want you to be living in community. We want you to be um, in a healthy way, not at either end of the spectrum, you know, not codependent and enmeshed, but also not completely detached or that's, family system stuff, right? We've, we've got this spectrum here. So what's healthy sacrifice? That's something that you need to be thinking of. You don't get to give up, right? Are you giving in or are you letting things being taken from you? Because ultimately that's so painful for both of you, right? You know that that's not making them truly happy and you know that you're not happy, right? Is this working for you? That's a Dr. Phil thing. If you are given in all the time, like we talked way back in unhealthy sacrifice, I would think that if you're asking this question, and I mean, really, this is such a great question because we all feel this way mm -hmm. at certain times. Okay, I'm sorry about the grammar, Shiloh. Don't say ain't. It ain't working for you, okay? I, there are school teachers everywhere around here. I better be careful. How do you define happiness? It's okay to think about it because you might really be feeling like you're not happy. Talk to your spouse about it, but also talk to God about it, because it's gonna be unique. It's gonna be different from your spouse, and it may be different than what you thought. And then finally, have you given away responsibility for your own happiness? This is something that it should be refreshing that you have control over, but also it's a lot of responsibility for yourself. I've said responsibility a lot. I mean, that's, whoo, sorry. No. That's, no. that's kind of really no. at the heart of this is that between you and God and having some hard conversations with your spouse, you may have to redefine some things. Yeah. We certainly don't want you to think that we 
have the perfect marriage that all of you should emulate? That's new. <laughs> right. Is there any risk of that? Yeah, right. <laughs> but we would say to you, and that's part of why I wanted to do this with Heather, our marriage has not always been easy. Our marriage has not always been healthy. We have probably both on occasion, uh, in our own ways, viewed the way we were sacrificing to one another in a very unhealthy way, or the way that we thought of happiness between us in a very unhealthy way. And what's good about our marriage today, and it's the best that it's ever been, is that we have had to work very hard together on thinking through things like you heard us talk about today. So really not because we're better than you, but because we have traveled that course just like you are or will, we would just encourage you that these kinds of things up on the screen will change the very nature of any relationship you're in, be it with your kid or your wife, your husband, or your best friend. So let me pray for you. And hey, will you thank my missus for doing such a uh, great job today? Um, she and Mark are going to get ready to sing, so let me pray for us.